Have you ever felt like you need a dictionary just to follow along at Mass? Sometimes as Catholics, we use these words, these Catholic words, and we presume that people know what they mean, but people don't always know what they mean. Sometimes even the practicing Catholics in the pews don't even know what some of these words mean. We use words like genuflect and tabernacle and homily and transubstantial, and sometimes they're just confusing things, and they can make sometimes the experience of Mass a little frustrating. So I thought it would be helpful to give a, a little guide. I'm going to walk through a dozen of the most commonly used Catholic words related to the Mass, and uh, hopefully uh, you learn something new or uh, get some of your questions answered. So here we go. Genuflect. The word genuflect simply means to bend the knee. It is something that we do whenever we as Catholics walk into a space where we know that Jesus is present in the Eucharist. We will drop to one knee uh, or we'll drop to two knees. It's a sign of reverence. It's a sign of adoration. It kind of goes back to the Middle Ages where you might have a, a king. And if you were to come into the presence of the king, you would drop down to one knee. And so we genuflect when we are in the presence of Jesus, who is our king. Tabernacle. A tabernacle is frequently found in a prominent place inside of a Catholic church. It's a box of some sort, usually ornately made uh, out of some very nice materials usually, and it's where we reserve uh, what remains after distribution of communion at Mass. And so if we have a remainder of Eucharist after distribution of communion, then we put it inside of this tabernacle, and it becomes a place for us to adore the Lord, a place to worship Him. Uh, it's a reminder that Jesus remains with us. We're using the word tabernacle, kind of lifting it from uh, the Old Testament. In the book of Exodus, we hear uh, Moses is instructed to build a, a tabernacle, and it becomes this, this meeting place. It becomes a, a place where the Lord comes to dwell in the Ark of the Covenant inside of this tabernacle, this tent. And so for us, the tabernacle inside of our churches is a reminder that God has come to be with us in Jesus and he remains with us in the Eucharist and we adore the Lord in the tabernacle itself. Liturgy. I recently used the word liturgy with somebody and they were completely confused what I was referring to. I was simply talking about the Good Friday service that we have, um, and, but it was really confusing for this person who had not heard that word before. The word liturgy tends to capture uh, what we're talking about when we as a community gather together for worship. Uh, historically, it meant public work, uh, and in a Christian context, it has meant uh, the public work of God on our behalf. And so uh, when we're talking liturgy, we're talking about our participation in what God is doing for his people. So it's a participation in Jesus's prayer to the Father. It is our participation in Jesus's uh, work of sharing the gospel. And so when we talk about liturgy, we're very frequently talking about our time together in worship. This would be uh, any time of communal prayer, probably at, at your parish. It would include the Catholic Mass. The Catechism says it even includes uh, works of active charity, works of, of the gospel. Whenever we are sharing in God's work of salvation, it's a form of liturgy. But we usually mean it to refer to public worship together. The Roman Missal. Now we're talking missile, not missile with an I. A missile uh, is a book. Uh, there's two books that are used uh, specifically for the celebration of the Mass. The Roman Missal is the primary book that is used at the altar. It's got a lot of instructions there for um, how the Mass is to be celebrated. It's got all the things that the priest and the deacon are supposed to do, and even some of the stuff that the people are supposed to be doing. And it has all of the prayers that the priest needs to use when celebrating the Mass. There also exists smaller versions of the Roman Missal that people can purchase. A lot of people like to follow along during the celebration of the Mass. They can follow along with all the prayers. They can read all the readings. So uh, uh, something small uh, and handy is it's helpful for people uh, to be able to follow along with the prayers that the priest is doing in the Roman Missal at the altar. Lectionary. The lectionary is the other book that is needed for the celebration of the Mass, and it has all of the readings inside of it. The word lexio in Latin means reading, so lectionary, lectionary, is the book with all of the readings. And in 1969, the Catholic Church kind of uh, revamped the lectionary and gave us a three-year Sunday cycle of readings and a two-year daily Mass cycle of readings, uh, covering a whole lot of the scriptures. In fact, in the early 70s, a number of Protestant denominations were really impressed with how comprehensive this Catholic lectionary was, that they either adopted it or they adapted it for themselves uh, for their own Sunday worship. And so uh, you might go to a, a, a Protestant church, you might be Episcopalian or Lutheran or Presbyterian or Methodist, and you might find that they're using either the same or a very similar cycle of readings that the Catholics created in the late 1960s. 
So we call this book the lectionary. Confidier. At the beginning of Mass, we call to mind our sins. It's a way of asking for Lord's mercy, preparing our hearts to be really attentive during this liturgy, and to uh, make us uh, hopefully worthy to be able to receive Jesus in Holy Communion. That will happen a little bit later in the Mass. Um, one of the prayers that we can pray during that time of calling to mind our sins is called the confidier. Confidier in Latin is a Latin word. It simply means I confess. And so that prayer that we can say at the beginning of Mass begins with I confess to Almighty God. It's a beautiful prayer uh, and it's just a simple um, confession of our sins and asking for the entire community and all of the saints to be praying for us for our sincere repentance of our sins. The homily. I would say most Catholics probably know what the word homily means, but it's very unfamiliar to a lot of people who are not Catholic. It's just the word that we as Catholics use to describe the sermon. Uh, it's the preaching. Uh, homily comes from a Greek word, homilane. It's used a handful of times in the New Testament, and it simply means talking, uh, having a chat. And so maybe the, the most notable example of it would be from Luke chapter 24, the road to Emmaus. You've got a couple of disciples who are, are walking from Jerusalem back to Emmaus, and the word that is used there says that they were talking, they were homilaying, however you put that in Greek. Uh, they were having a conversation about the things that had happened in the last few days. But then Jesus is standing near them. They didn't realize that Jesus walks with them. And then he opens for them everything from the scriptures that pointed to himself. And so I think that we like to point at that particular passage on why we use the word homily. Because uh, it was a conversation they were having about the things that God has done. And then Jesus opened the scriptures for them so that they would understand what God was doing. And in a way, that's the preacher's job. Uh, at a Catholic Mass is to give a homily, have a conversation in a way, talk about what God has been doing, he's been showing us, uh, and through his scriptures and through his work, and help to open that up for us and help us to apply it to our own lives. So that's what we call the homily. Creed. On Sundays after the homily, we very frequently say the creed. The creed is simply a statement of belief. Uh, the word credo in Latin means I believe. It is a, a simple statement of belief. Um, there have been creeds since the very early church. Within the first century, we have uh, creeds developing. Uh, the oldest that, that we use at the Mass is called the Apostles' Creed. Um, centuries later, uh, as the church was wrestling with heresies in the world and trying to define things more clearly of what do we believe about uh, who Jesus is and Jesus' relationship with the Father and the Son, we started to put some more specific uh, language around what we believe about Jesus and what we believe about the Trinity. And so uh, we have, oh, from the councils of Nicaea and, the, and Constantinople, um, a, a more comprehensive creed was developed. We call that the Nicaean Constantinopolitan Creed. Uh, that's the one we very frequently hear at Sunday Masses across the world. Christians have been reciting the creed together at Mass for centuries. It's a way of professing together that we are in communion with one another before we receive communion with one another in the Eucharist. Consubstantial. If you've ever heard the creed being said at Mass and you heard the word consubstantial, you might have thought to yourself, what does that mean? <laughs> it's not a common word, obviously. It's a very uh, specific, it's a very precise word that uh, the church developed uh, over time to be able to describe how is it uh, that Jesus is divine. Is he another God, like God the Father and God the Holy Spirit? What does this mean? So in kind of parsing all of that out through the Council of Nicaea and Constantinople, um, the, the word that was developed was consubstantial. It means one in being. It shares one being with the other. So Jesus is one in being with the Father, meaning that he is fully divine while at the same time being fully human. So he shares God's nature. He is God. That's all the word consubstantial means. Epiclesis. I would say even most Catholics are not familiar with the word epiclesis. Uh, it's a word that sometimes altar servers are aware of because they, there's a particular moment of the Mass when the priest extends his hands over the bread and the wine that are on the altar, and sometimes the altar server is informed that that moment is called the epiclesis. The epiclesis uh, simply means invocation. Uh, if you were to uh, break it out into the, the Greek uh, parts, uh, it means the calling upon. Uh, so it's calling upon God, calling upon the Holy Spirit to descend upon this altar. We're asking, we're, the priest is calling upon the Holy Spirit to descend upon this altar and to transform bread and wine into Jesus' body and blood. That's the epiclesis. Consecration. For something to be consecrated, it simply means that it is dedicated. It is set aside for some 
divine purpose that's usually done through a prayer or that's done uh, with a blessing. When we're talking about the Mass specifically, we're talking about that moment in which the priest is praying over the bread and the wine, and he's using the words that Jesus used over the bread and wine at the Last Supper. We call those the words of institution, and that moment uh, in which uh, the priest is praying those words over the bread and the wine, we call that the moment of consecration, when it really changes into Jesus' body and blood. Transubstantiation. In addition to being maybe the most fun word to say, it happens to be the most important thing that happens when we go to Mass. After the priest calls down the Holy Spirit through the epiclesis, and he says the words of consecration over the bread and the wine, a miracle happens. And we would call that miracle transubstantiation. It means that uh, the bread and the wine have actually changed in their deepest reality. They've changed in their substance. Now it is fully Jesus' body and blood. It's a very precise theological term to express what it is that we as Catholics believe happens at the Mass when, when the priest is saying those words. Not every Christian denomination believes that what's happening uh, when they celebrate communion is that bread and wine actually become Jesus' body and blood. They might believe that it is still regularly bread while at the same time being Jesus' body. Uh, they might believe that uh, it's just a symbol. It's not actually changed in any way into Jesus' body. They might believe that it is Jesus' body and blood only while the community is gathered together, but as soon as the community disperses, then that bread can just go back onto a shelf or into a cabinet and be used again later. Um, so we use this word transubstantiation to be very precise about what it is that we believe. We believe that bread and wine have actually transformed in their deepest reality, in their substance, to become Jesus' body and blood, and it is now that way. That is why we reserve the remainders of Holy Communion and place Jesus in the Eucharist in the tabernacle for us to be able uh, to reverence and adore at another time. So I hope that you have found this guide to be helpful, at least to explain some words that you may have heard used in reference to the Catholic Mass. Maybe you've learned something new here. Maybe it's something that you can share with somebody who's just trying out Catholic Mass really for the first time, and they're just starting to get uh, interested in the Catholic Church and exploring. I think that understanding some of these things can help to understand uh, the deeper meaning of what we're doing as Catholics when we come to pray at the Mass. There's a whole lot of Catholic words out there um, that I think that people don't know the meaning to. I'll probably make another video uh, kind of capturing some of those other Catholic terms, but I hope that these at least captured the most important ones in reference to the Catholic Mass. God bless you.